Loud and Quiet presents Midnight Chats. Hi everyone, welcome to The Witching Hour once again. It is the 8th of February 2018 and um, it's time for another episode of the Loud and Quiet interview podcast, Midnight Chats. It's been a long day today. I've only just got home. Um, I've been out at the theatre in the West End of London, in theatre land. Not something I do very often, but I've just been to see The Book of Mormon, which I've wanted to see since it came over to the UK and um, what an incredible show that is I mean I don't like musicals it's not for me but this is the best thing about this show is that it's for cynics basically who don't really like musicals I was staring at the stage and grinning like a small child in wonder I um, this isn't a great theatre review is it but trust me Go and see that musical if you haven't already. Uh, It's a bit sweary. And if you like religion, then it it might not be for you either. But um, I enjoyed that a lot. In the day, um, in fact, in the day, every day this year, we're currently doing a big project at Loud and Quiet. We're redesigning our magazine, which will be relaunching on the 10th of March. That's something that we do as well as this podcast. So if you are not aware of that or haven't checked that out, please do check out our website, loudandquiet.com, where you can also find all the information about our issues that we put out. Our current one has King Gizzard and the Lizard Wizard on the cover. For now, though, you're here to hear our podcast. And my guest tonight is Gweno Saunders, uh, a musician from Wales. And this is is quite a beautiful piece of planning because today as we tick over into a new day at midnight it is today welsh language music day that's an important thing because gweno is not only a welsh lady and musician she's someone who is very very proud of her heritage she made her debut album in 2015 completely in welsh which is not really something that many people do and um, that was a great record with a real sci-fi undercurrent it translated to the last day and as i say the whole thing was in welsh it was kind of kraut rocky and a bit psychedelic very much recommend that album her new album is called lakov and gweno's gone one further And she's recorded this one completely in Cornish. Now, only 200 people in the world fluently speak Cornish. And I know what you're already thinking. It's not for me, Stuart. I don't want to hear an album completely in Cornish. I don't speak Cornish. And I can see why you would come to that conclusion. But like Gweno's previous album, Lakov is such a beautiful electronic album that it really doesn't matter that you can't understand a word she's saying. It's just a very gentle and kind of hypnotic listen. It comes out on March the 2nd via Heavenly. Go back and listen to The Last Day as well, released two years ago, also on Heavenly. And I don't think you're going to be disappointed, even if you don't speak Welsh or Cornish. Gweno's led a really interesting life so far. At the age of 17, she left Cardiff, where she grew up, and went to live in Las Vegas for two years where she danced in Michael Flatley's Lord of the Dance. Um, We speak a little bit about that at the beginning of this podcast, and it sounds like a very strange and kind of sad time. She then moved back to the UK and to Brighton, where she joined girl group The Pipettes, who you may remember for wearing some pretty great polka dot dresses and doing synchronised dance moves whilst um, singing kind of some very kitsch and retro fun songs. And uh, now she's back in Cardiff where she lives with her two-year-old son and her husband, Reese, who makes the music with her. They collaborate on all of Gweno's music together. Thank you for downloading this podcast. Please do subscribe if you haven't already. We've got, um, I think we're going to do 
a podcast next week and the following week instead of um so there so there's going to be three in a row over the next three weeks enjoy this one and we'll be back in seven days time greg will be your host then and um until then please do enjoy this conversation that i had with gweno Happy Welsh Language Music Day. Of course. That's today now. It is actually, isn't it? We'll be the first people to say... To say that. ...Dydd Music Rhaig Hapis. How long has that been going on? I don't think it's been going on. I thought a few years now. It's, yeah, fantastic. I only actually found out about it because we got like a promotional pack. Oh, okay. And a, with an illustration of you. Have How you seen cool this? I know. It's really good. So cool. Yeah. yeah. So you're like a poster person for today. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there's a lot of really good Welsh music in general going on, both languages. So, yeah. yeah. Fantastic. Are you typically a nighttime person? A bit too much, yeah. Because, Are you? yeah, well, because. I've got a two-year-old son, and mm-hmm. you think, right, as soon as he gets to sleep, I can do something. But he doesn't sleep till quite late. Right, okay. So he's a bit of a night owl. So I'm definitely up at this time. Does he get that from you? Have you always been someone? Well, no, he gets that from his dad, okay. who's very much a night owl, okay. and makes most of his music in the middle of the night. So I think he, I think it's... And so it's difficult, because Nico's like... Well, no one else is going to sleep, so, so why, why should, should I? I? Yeah. <laughs> what are you guys doing? <laughs> yeah, it's a bit of that going on. I've all, I always felt like that. As, I still feel like that and did as a kid. Mm. I've always felt like going to sleep is kind of like giving in a bit. Oh, totally. I've like, have you have you made the most of your day? Mm. Yeah. I completely. It, I felt I feel that way about sleep, which is wrong. I definitely remember having to go to sleep when there was still sunlight coming through the curtains and being mm. a bit annoyed about it in the summer. Yeah, that yeah, was that's always. It's like, what are you doing? I did dancing when I was little, so I was always travelling around, so I probably would have been up quite late anyway. Mm. So I've always been up late. And then you, yeah, sort of transition to gigs and stuff. So you're always up late, aren't you? Really? I suppose as a musician, it is mm. just a night time. It's a nocturnal thing. It really is. Just generally. Mm. So you grew up in, in Cardiff. Yeah. And you still live there now. Yeah, you back. Back there. Mm. You, but you moved away because you went to... I. So we met in Cardiff a we couple did, of yeah. years ago. Yeah. You, you gave us a tour around. I did, yeah. I've been back since, actually. That Have was the, you? Because that was the first time I've been. Okay. When I, when I met you. Yeah. And I was back there last year. And I was in your manager's office. Yeah. In the arcade. Mm. And they were like, oh, Gweno's back here. And I was <laughs> like, all oh, right. Okay. And then they took me kind of to a window yeah and there was that huge mural of you yeah. on, on club i fall back <laughs> i know to explain that to anyone who's not been there or seen it it's it is a the, the side of a whole building is mm. of your face is that yeah. still there at the moment? yeah it was a project called get it right i think that it was about celebrating local culture and i think going to gigs and things like that and then it was just really weird chain of events and um guy called mark james that designed it and then there was a graffiti artist that painted it um yeah and i i I think it was just quite random that i was chosen to to do it and then it was yeah two weeks after nico was born it was finished and then i took nico to see it the other day and he's like (laughs) mum mum like this because it must be really weird because he probably thinks everyone's mum's on a wall like it's it's quite a normal thing it's like but yeah, very, um, yeah, really honoured, obviously. And it's sort of quite sci-fi because of it was based around the theme of my last album. Mm. Yeah, and then I keep an eye on uh, Alan and Kevin to yeah. style office and make sure that they're working every day. <laughs> Looming over <laughs> yeah, them at all It's times. like some kind of like Lenin-esque or like Stalin-esque mural looking over people as they're working, yeah. It was funny because I, um, very long time ago, as a professional Irish dancer, as a teenager and i and i um danced at the new york new york casino in las vegas and i was actually on the side of a bus were you so i've been on a bus on a wall wow so there's like this theme happening i don't know it's just very random again it was just like so they just check my face on the side of the bus okay so the bus yeah um was it just the one bus it no it was quite a few buses it's like a fleet of buses the buses that go up and down the strip 
Okay. This, so is, in, this is in Las Vegas. Yeah. And this is when you're doing the... So you, you moved to Vegas when you were like... 17. 17. Yeah. Why would... So... And you were dancing... It Was this when you were dancing in, in Lord, of Lord of the Dance? Yeah. yeah. As you do. Yeah, as you do. Um, which is, <laughs> in itself is a mad thing. Completely. A completely insane thing. Re- so again, th- it's just very random, like paying 50p to go to class. And then all of a sudden it's like, you can earn a living. And, mm. and and you can like escape from your hometown because you're like, what am I going to do? And then someone goes, here's a ticket to Australia or whatever. And you're like, oh, amazing. Great. I'll take it. Yeah. And then you're on a bus. And then you're on a bus. So when you're on the so you'd see these buses driving past mm. with your face on. Mm. Was it just you? Was there some other people in this picture? Or is it just, <laughs> just, your, it's just your big face? <laughs> I've got a photo of one. I need to get it out, actually. Were you in? The like life the... is like that. You know, it's just quite random. Were you in like a costume? Were you oh, in yeah. Costume? Like you were... looking sort of as angelic as I could possibly could in this sort of white dress. What was Vegas like to live in? I think awful. people... It's were, just were... horrendous. Really? It was awful. Awful. Did you... How long were you there? Two years. It was awful. Two years. It was awful. Don't people say that it's worth going to Vegas for like a weekend, but yeah, you don't do. need, you don't need any longer than that? No, that's the, exactly what they say. And they're right. And you were there for two years. Oh, my God. It's just... So it's just, you know, it's yeah, you just saw because I'd read, um, I tried to, um, rough guides to Las Vegas, and rough guides are really good. And actually, I think it really oversold Las Vegas a little bit because it sort of, you know, suggested a lot more history than what actually is left. Because you know, even like the old bit and stuff, and you know, they give you a bit of a backstory. And I was just so, I remember landing. And just being so disappointed <laughs> as soon as I landed going, oh, my God. And then, like, living seven miles from the strip. But you can see it as if it's right there because it's you're so flat. Because it's so flat, right? And I was like, I'll just take a walk. <laughs> That's three hours later. I was still walking. I still hadn't arrived. It's just, um, oh, I don't know. I don't know what to say about it, to be so honest. You, so, so you were over it as soon as you got there. I was, yeah. So I was. Did you? Was it that you had to stay for two years? Were you on a contract that was kind of? I like... was, yeah. It was like every six months we got to go home for two weeks. Okay. And um, it was really odd. It was, yeah. It kind of throws you a bit because I think when um, it was so different, I think to the sort of homely um, kind of commu- community feel of all of these interests that I'd sort of been a part of. You know, yeah. it's like going to your like local youth club and just doing a hobby, and then all of a sudden it's like, whoa it's the Las Vegas Strip and then there's like lots of glitter and lights and it's just so far it's just like the Americanization of something mm. um and I always say like oh, I remember to meet people go, oh you know I've lived in Las Vegas and oh, there's nothing like America it's like and it's really true because obviously m- all of North America is very different from the rest of it because it's so varied but I definitely felt that it, it was a, about something American you know yeah. like undeniably American sure. like the, it was very it's like the vulgarity of it um, mm. which I really fully embraced and bought massive wigs and things oh god I, loved, did... I look like Simba <laughs> just like a big lion <laughs> I was just I don't know like a lollipop basically <laughs> what do... a hairy lollipop <laughs> oh, well. what does a typical day in Las Vegas for two years yeah. look like what do, mm. what because do, you're dancing at night or did yeah, you, did you but show... I, eventually I got into um, techno because there was a club on, um, yeah, because we were just bored shitless. And there was a club on Las Vegas Strip called Utopia. That was like a dance club. It was like the only dance club like where big DJs at the time, late 90s. Fat Boy Slim. Yeah. That kind and, of, yeah, yeah, that kind of thing. Carl Cox. Oh, like Carl this. Cox came and DJed at my university. Did he? Yeah. yeah. So it was that kind of circus. <laughs> yeah. sort of. And it was weird because I think that all of the sort of acid house that happened. It's odd that relationship, I think, between Europe, the UK and North America with electronic music going back and forth all the time. Because when I was there, it was like the height of like dance music and people really excited. And I remember when I came back and I'd go to places in Cardiff and like the club nights because the Hippo Club had closed down, which I never got to, which was like the legendary Acid House Club in Cardiff. Um, and then I remember coming back and going out to nights in Cardiff and it's really depressing because people had been doing it for about a decade and they were a bit tired at that point. Whereas in Las Vegas at that point, everyone was really excited and it was all really new and like... You know, we were all just like teenagers managed to, to sort of sneak into a dance club and like just staying up all night. And then 
that really helped actually because it was a real like a real escapism from the monotony of having to repeat yourself constantly and yeah and just being so far away from home and all of that stuff so it was yeah it was it i mean it was it did that i suppose i sort of got more into electronic music did you ever get into the slots what dj no like ga- no like gambling did you ever go into no i did gamble. gamble once but again i was you know 17 oh yeah so you couldn't no not really is it 21 on yeah. gambling yeah so, okay, so right. you're just like going in on f- fake id ids everywhere but so there's not there's just not much to do i guess just, just boring it's making me feel a bit weird talking <laughs> about it because i haven't actually thought about it for such a long time it's an amazing thing to have done though well i think if someone says i think with it like life in general it's like if someone says oh do you want to do this you don't say no i don't think maybe you do if you're wiser <laughs> But sometimes you need to do the bad thing to know that you shouldn't have done it. Yeah. And it's, you know, and also I always think, you know, when you're really, really, really old, hopefully, and you're sat down and like, maybe you're lucky to have grandchildren. I say, oh, what did you do? And you say, like, just, you've always got a story to tell them. I was on a well, bus this, in Vegas. Yeah, like this one time, you know, you, you, you always like, I think it's, you need your little adventures so that you can tell your like little stories and they'll be like, whoa. But you're really old and wrinkly. How did you ever do that? Yeah. How did that you ever meet thing? Michael Flatley? Was Michael Flatley in the show when you were in the show? Well, I did dance with Michael Flatley at um, in Frankfurt in in the sort of amphitheater where Hitler gave all his speeches, <laughs> <laughs> which I always loved. So I was like, yeah, this is like this is culture squared. Yeah, <laughs> this is mental. <laughs> but I really enjoyed that. So, okay. Yeah. Because it was such a random thing. But yeah, and then yeah, it was just um, we sort of got sent off as a troupe of dancers, and then got left to our own devices. Mayhem. Okay, it was complete mayhem. Yeah. yeah. Vegas is obviously I've never been, but it's mm. obviously such a bizarre place and a, a unique, strange mm. party town. Mm. And I imagine that's weird for anyone to mm. go to. But you were not only were you really young and seventeen, mm. but you'd grown up kind. You'd grown up in Wales, but you yeah. you you weren't exposed to much pop music where you're all popular no. culture as a as a kid um he had a very skewed um perception of pop m- culture which is mm. probably why i was like vegas fantastic because <laughs> maybe if i was more aware of it as a you know a concept i may have gone mm, that's probably not a good idea but yeah just yeah completely detached from it and i suppose that was part of the reason why i wanted to do it wasn't it it's like let's go to the epicenter of capitalism yeah and everything that home isn't I guess. everything yeah, yeah like the extreme opposite i still haven't digested that experience to work out what the positives were yeah <laughs> i'm still trying to work that out because it was just really weird so with the the wall not the bus but the wall of the you wall. yeah um <laughs> obvi- the wall. obviously <laughs> your son recognizes it as mm. you mm. has anyone else like uh, you've not been supposed to, like there's the lady of no, the wall I don't, yeah and there's no, wall lady there's the wall lady yeah well the, i mean the sort of coincidentally i go out less because i've had a, a child yeah and you and your hair's different to and the my wall. hair's different yeah. so because obviously club Bar will be the place that you go because that's where all the good gigs are so yeah it's not i haven't had to stand underneath it too often for people to go what are you doing here so i think so it's been fine yeah it's been absolutely fine growing up you in your home mm. you spoke welsh and cornish yeah and english as a third yeah English as well, but English, but but not at home. We just don't know. You would you would just speak. Yeah. So your dad is a is a he's a Cornish poet. Yeah. He's from is he he's from Cornwall from St Judy. Okay. From St Judy, yeah, and then um yeah, and he learned I think learned Cornish from a schoolmaster at the local primary school, um and then, but he's quite good with languages. Yeah. Are you good with other languages? I've not. I've not felt that I'm amazing. I'm definitely not someone that would just pick it up. So it's yeah, you're so it's odds to be sort of find yourself in quite a specialist subject within linguistics mm. when you're actually not a linguist. Yeah, I don't think so anyway. I've never felt yeah, I definitely 
don't have any expertise at all. How many people speak Cornish fluently? I think a few hundred. See, and you're one of them. Mm. That's quite a, that's obviously a, quite, quite a special. Intense. <laughs> quite intense. <laughs> it is quite intense, isn't it? It is. But I suppose that's why also people would maybe presume if you know Cornish, mm. if you're one of the 200 people that speaks Cornish fluently, yeah. that you would probably also speak Spanish and French. And yeah. So they'd probably just presume that, wouldn't they, yeah. I guess? Yeah, because I think it is about, I think it's about 500 fluent speakers and then it's in the thousands that can converse to a certain level and, and actually it's growing more, yeah. which kind of made me feel, it encouraged me to write in Cornish as well. So your last album, your debut solo album mm. from two years ago yeah. was in, it was all Welsh except for the last track, which was Cornish. Yeah. And then this new album yeah. is all Cornish. Yeah. Yeah. That's hardcore, isn't it? I, I yeah. love it. It's like... <laughs> That's what I thought, because I thought, oh, what can you do? So you've got to always get to that place, because I think that I, what I learned from Adi Dolab was, like, try and get to the most uncompromising uncom- position that you can, and then you might be in a better position to start. Because I wanted to explore the language anyway, um, and I, again, felt that it would m- perhaps give me freedom creatively, because I couldn't imagine it. And there weren't a huge amount of influences, although I do have it Cornish language music influences. Um, that was a quite a good place to start and then explore and and actually and actually take a bit of ownership because I think when you're raised with this really quite it's not specialist really it's just a very small thing that is not partic- is not common at all and it, it makes you f- so it can you know it's definitely at times made me feel like I don't fit in anywhere. Mm. And they think, well, that's probably the good thing that you need to use because that's your tool to explore what that means because actually it's a common feeling. And I don't think it's, you know, none of us feel like we belong anywhere or feel, you know, we all feel a bit weird. Um, So I just thought that was a good starting point and to sort of just take, just claim a bit of ownership over really. And I was like, right, if this is my language, I've got to use it in the way that I use language and just claim a bit of ownership over it. And I do, and it's really scary as well because I think you're even more, you know, you feel the fragility of a language that 500 people speak and you think, oh, best not touch it because it might break. But actually you've got to do the opposite because you've got to use it and you've got to be brutal with it and you've got to sort of be carefree and really aggressive and t- to try things out and work out patterns. And I mean, it's like with music, really, you've got to sort of bash it out and bash it about and then you sort of reach somewhere. What you've done with Look Off, the new record, mm. I'm guessing, and this is probably a safe thing to guess, okay. <laughs> I'm presuming this, mm. but you're using it in a way that no one, probably no one ever has. Because I imagine the other 200 people speak in fluent Cornish, like your dad's a poet, mm. and that's quite a traditional way to, to mm. use language, but you're using it with the type of music you're, that you make. It, it's probably never been done before, is that safe uh, Yeah, I say? don't think so, yeah, but it's kind of... It's again, it's I think the combination of working with Shreese again on the records because I think what Shreese creates is I think his worlds with his layers and he creates a landscape with his production. There's a song on there mm. called Is the Cheese? Yeah. Ex- so, yeah. Explain this. What is so this? It's, it's a phrase I found in a book from I think the 18th century and it's Is there cheese? Is there or isn't there? If there's cheese, bring cheese. If there's no cheese, bring what's easy. And I was just like, that's amazing. I love cheese. Apologies to all vegans. But I really do. And I just thought it was fantastic. It was just such a sort of chanty thing. And like when I think of Cornish, I think of it as a very um, home, playful language. Because I don't attach it to anything apart from family and community. And so it's a lot of fun and silliness. And that just fitted in brilliantly. And then... The verses are all just like place names in Cornish. And so it's like a call to arms about is finding some cheese. And the great thing is because it's sung in Cornish. Yeah. If you were doing that, you couldn't get away with is there cheese in no. English. Because no. people would be like, this is kind of a bit silly. Or they yeah. wouldn't, yeah, but it sounds kind of romantic yeah. and beautiful <laughs> yeah, when yeah, it's yeah. done in Cornish. It's just about cheese. Yeah. yeah, but it's just a song called Is There Cheese? Yeah. Which is great. There are bits of, when I first heard the record, mm. even though I knew it was in Cornish, um, it kind of just sounds like it's got a French feel to the record. Yeah, no, we were thinking a lot about like Serge Gainsbourg, definitely. Like and the strings and the, yeah, some of the arrangements. Definitely, and things, yeah. we were, and particularly like the way he 
was amazing at conceptualizing his records as well and just sort of again you know with very little equipment because we made it all at home with you know we don't have synths and things like that really it's all sort of quite lo-fi um but yeah and i think we really wanted to create a sort of 70s feel yeah quite prog mm. and quite celtic which I'm, I'm really fully embracing of and actually i think yes let's do this because obviously i've done other people's version of what celtic is particularly with lord of the dance <laughs> um and i think that there are better ways you of... mean that wasn't authentic lord of the well. dance <laughs> It's quite exciting as a teenager because it was so like rejecting of like sort of the conservative element of Irish dance. So like as as a teenager, you were like, wow, this is like a rock show, which it obviously wasn't. But that's how we saw it. We were like, wow. I remember seeing it on um, Eurovision. When, yeah. When they first showed it. Yeah, River Dance is way more classy, though. I was in that as well, and that was way more ah, classy. Ah, yeah, no, you're mm. right. Lord of Dance was the after. Like that, the, yeah, Lord of Dance is like the really tacky one. Was it? What's, yeah, it was like... What's tackier about it then? Well, it's like... Oh, God, there was a dance in it called Strip Jig. Okay. Oh, it was awful. It was just <laughs> like... You sort of jig around in a dress, and then you, like, take a dress off, and you're just, like, in a crop top and shorts. It's awful. <laughs> it's awful. It's like... um Yeah, it's they, like, they didn't have that at Eurovision. No, but. they definitely didn't, but it's just so much to do with religion and stuff as well, because I think there was a lot of that, because, like, the history of Irish dancing is, like, the reason why people have to put their hands by their side is because of the Catholic Church, where, like, you can't use your arms because it's too suggestive. Oh, so right. that's why it all went into the feet, and then, like sort of Riverdance thing was this burst of like Catholic suppression going mental and everyone going yes we can just strip <laughs> and we can just move our arms around and so and particularly like because there were so many teenage girls in that yeah. um, so I think there was a lot of that it was just sort of went mental right so I think this is quite an interesting sort of context to why that show was so tacky okay <laughs> I'm probably going to get sued for that there we go <laughs> So the last record, yeah, it played a lot on technology, yeah, and it was a protest record in lots of ways. Mm, um, yeah, how does this one fit? Well, I think that um, because obviously Welsh is a wider spoken language, I think there are more variations of expression in that language, and so I was quite interested in finding influences that perhaps hadn't been as celebrated or utilized particularly post-punk sort of electronic things that were a lot colder in feeling um rather than a sort of homely folk thing there's i think probably there's more frustration in my al last album but i was gonna say when we yeah. met in when we met yeah in, in cardiff and and you were showing us around it felt like that was a time when there was a lot of frustration about a lot mm. of the things about Cardiff and things that we were talking about, the buildings they were knocking down. We went to Butte Town. Yeah. Is that right? And um, and just kind of pointing out the things like this could, this shouldn't be like this. And this should, like, mm. this record's less like that, is it? It's, it's think, less of a frustration. I think what, what it was as well was that, particular, I mean, obviously with everything and even like creatively the content and, you know, from film to television and, you know, it was a very dystopian album which it was like a sort of wanted to make but I think with this one I was also I think just wanting to be as positive as I possibly could as well because I'm not sure how much it adds to the conversation at the moment to be negative particularly creatively because I think I th I've, well for me it was just trying to find a utopia rather than going look how shit everything yeah. because we know everybody like really we know that we absolutely know that now i mean it's like two years ago even like two years down the line we know that mm. way more than we did two years ago yeah so you almost feel that you sort of looking and i and i felt that cornish could give me that because of its utopian nature and wanting to exist and that it's always drawn artists and the creativity of reviving a language and it flourishing like you know a flower <laughs> <laughs> I remember you saying to me about about Welsh language music actually mm. at the time that people make it to for it to exist there's no expectations if you make a, a Welsh language album you're not making it to become a millionaire or successful in any way you're not trying to get on an advert for a car you're mm. just making it so it 
exists and it's an artifact and i guess that's even more the case in in cornish it's, it's kind of even or it's at least exactly the same i guess oh, definitely and i think that that's such a, a really powerful um sentiment to attach yourself to as an artist as well and to remember because i think it's a really great motivational point as a, as a starting point that you're making something because it doesn't exist which I, I think you know again you know obviously my, minority cultures can do that there's there's every cha- yeah you're you're creating you feel more that you're creating the narrative than perhaps you would do in a humongous narrative mm. and i think it's just a very um I, don't know, I think it's a really really wise thing to remember as well when you're making i think a lot of young bands that i speak to who who are who aren't who are even making something kind of a bit more commercial and it's in english and it's kind of maybe it's just quite standard in its structure and its sound i just think more and more people feel that as well like the idea of being david bowie Mm. in the modern age when the music industry doesn't have that kind of structure and that's kind of support and money anymore I think it's quite... I remember when I used to try and be in bands when I was in school and stuff, the idea was always like, oh, we're going to try and get a record deal and become famous. And now when I speak to to young bands, that's not even on the... That, that, You're so right. That's savvy yeah, enough to know true. that it's not the case anymore. Yeah, and everything's so much more DIY. You're absolutely right. So that spirit's there everywhere. But I think that's what makes it interesting as well, isn't it? Because it actually puts everyone on an equal footing. Yeah. Which is really exciting. And it makes it fun again. If you completely reject the idea that you're going to become it's going to become your job even Mm. then you can just enjoy it for what it is in the same way that people enjoy yoga or whatever you know and i find that i don't know obviously my only experience really is with bands in wales but i find younger musicians so incredibly hard working as well like Mm. i think that that and i think it's because they've grown up in a harsher climate as well i just find them really a lot more do it yourself like you say but i think that yeah they they yeah like you said they would never expect any i mean they wouldn't even expect to at any point have a tour manager for example no. like yeah. they just for anybody now like anybody making music which is really positive creatively it's positive isn't it yeah i think so yeah there's also a track on the album called computer yeah which is obviously about technology yeah am i right in thinking it's about like that kind of love hate relationship we had with technology we can't kind of live with hate our phones but we kind of can't live yeah. without them, that kind of thing how are you with technology Awful. generally i'm all, i just i've definitely overused my phone do you oh god yeah awful but i, I think i just wanted because again like because cornish again I, I sort of wanted to discuss something modern i think that was the idea really and also the fact that um there's, um, and I, I'm not a linguist, so I don't know how this works, but there are um, computers that can read manuscripts and they sort of detect it and they can help with forming. I, I don't know what I'm talking about. Is this like an AI thing? Yeah. Well, no, it's not. It's like older than that because this okay. happened in the 80s with Cornish. So I just wanted to talk about the technological influence on the language and it sort of predicts phrase, like turn of phrase, like... Th- um sentences and things like that okay i don't know what i'm talking about so to i apologize to any linguist that's listening to me going what the hell is that but um i just wanted to talk about that just just bring a sort of modern context because i was aware that i was mentally somewhere between the fifth and the 17th century when i was making this album (laughs) so i just really felt like whoa 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 right you know this is all a little bit middle ages and um, Age of the Saints. So I think, you know, we really need to bring this back up to speed. And the fact that, you know, technology had been part of the language and everything. So I just wanted to, and yeah, and just that that feeling, because I think there may have been some heated discussions about using that sort of technology with, with the language. And I thought, well, you know, you, can, you can't live with it. You can't live without it. And you're infuriated by it, but you're also glad that it's happened type of thing. So it's like this sort of unrequited love relationship that's very complicated and I think that's how we emotionally feel about technology and I thought it would just yeah I, and I sort of I definitely wanted the Cornish language to be having a conversation with a computer as well not to be left out because everyone else is having a conversation with there it. There is that idea isn't there that that 
Cornwall and Wales as well, that kind of <clears throat> recurring gag that everything is still 50 years behind mm. and, and that kind of idea. When you think of Cornwall, you think of it being like little cottages and seaside towns and all very quaint and mm. fishing boats and things. Mm. And of course, they do have computers there. Well, I think that most of uh, the UK's internet goes from underneath Cornwall. Oh, does it? Yeah. Okay. So I think actually is quite a... It's on a bed of technology. I think so, yeah. As well as having, I think, like 99% of the world's... Um, what would you call them in English? I know it's Moina in Welsh. Um, what do you call it? You know, like elements in in rock. Like sediment. No, but you know, like it's got tin. It's got... Uh, like oh, yeah. The minerals. Minerals. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> minerals and yeah and again you know the sort of um the industrial heritage of cornwall as well which obviously leads on to computers and things as well yeah your son is only two right mm. so this is obviously not something you need to worry about yet but have you thought about when he'll be allowed a phone and things like that mm. i've got some nephews and nieces and they're all getting to the age where they want phones it's one of them two of them have got phones mm. And one of them is on Instagram. Oh, I know. And she's it's, only yeah. ten, mm. but she's it's quite she's quite sweet on it. Mm. But I think if it was my child, I'd, I I it that would fill me with pure dread. And it's weird because I think it's really interesting when you see it's my little brother's fifteen and he is a different person. It's amazing, like he's a different character on. The online his yeah. like online presence yeah okay. it's just not the same person that talks to me it's like wow because that's really fascinating i think for people that have been born into having personas yeah that's really weird i don't know how you avoid it i, really, I mean i'm sure there's it's a good reason not to be on it or encourage your children to be on it definitely and i don't know what the answer is and yeah. i'm actually not going to be on any kind of high horse about no. it at all but it's tough isn't it and also because you also don't want them to like you can't really like say no you're not doing that because mm. it's part of the world now it's part and of also life, like they it? give kids tablets in primary school and mm. stuff so how do you differentiate between having a tablet and not being able to look on youtube i'm so glad he's two yeah by the time he's 10 mm. maybe there won't be any internet anymore imagine that It'd be a imagine, fa that. imagine if it was all just a fad and it all just well i yeah i I'm sort of i still feel like it might be yeah it's, sort of, it's really odd it's still quite early isn't it because the amount of like you invest more and more of, of yourself into it or you like or your time at least not more of yourself really that's the weird thing so i think you sort of after using the internet particularly social media for a few years you sort of start getting to that point of like you know you're not revealing your meals and you know as much as perhaps you yeah. did initially going oh you know i can yeah. tell my friends in <laughs> you know far away what i've had for breakfast or whatever it was like it's changed a lot hasn't it people yeah. have become more savvy to yeah, it yeah but um oh, it's hot. do you social media a lot do mm, you, are you i'm awful i'm terrible i really well i think my excuse really is because and I, especially with twitter for me because i think when you have more sort of um lesser less popular interests maybe it's a really useful tool for finding people it's that have the community. same community mm. yeah yeah and i do still find that because i ca i kind of generally don't see well people do retweet awful things and you're like oh god but i can almost blank that sort of stuff out because mm. it's just so so what ones mm. are you on are you facebook I'm not on Facebook, no. I'm not on Facebook either. Did you ever join? Yeah. But you cancelled. You cancelled yeah. it, did you? Yeah. My wife tried to do that recently. Yeah. Because I, I never, I never joined that one. Oh, fantastic! So, I've never, I've never tasted all of it's got to offer. So I've never had to quit it. You really doesn't offer very much. But my wife tried to quit, and she said that when you try and cancel your, your. Uh, membership that's not the right word whatever your, page, your whatever. account yeah. your account yeah um it starts to go through all the people that you're friends with so it's if you're like amy's gonna miss you and it shows you a picture of amy and it says john's it's gonna awful. miss you to try and kind of make you stay and then like you you're not sure if you've deleted it and for ages i thought i deleted it but you can't delete there's like you've got to get down to a little bit further down and then yeah. you delete it because you can like you can just 
pause deactivate it. it. Yeah, deactivate. And That's then you it. can reactivate yeah. it. Yeah. They don't want you to leave. Did she manage to leave in the end? No, she's still on it. She's still... Which, Does she really hate it? Just like, what am I doing on here? I think... I think when you get to a certain age as well, mm. it's kind of, it's useful, isn't it? If you've, if you've been traveling or you've met people from elsewhere, you can keep in touch with people. Mm. Um, so I think she kind of likes it for that. But having not been on it myself, everyone I know, they always say, I've got one friend in particular, and he'll say, oh, so-and-so got married or whatever. I say, oh yeah, how did you, like, oh, did you speak to them? And they say, and he'll always say, "No, no, I um, sorry, on Facebook, I'm not, I'm not on there much. I, I never go on there." He says it all the time, and I never go on there. But no one's got a good word to say about Facebook at all. I think it makes everyone really depressed, doesn't it? Everyone's down on it. No, one, I've never met someone who says I'm on Facebook and I love it. And I no, love I don't think so. It. Yeah, hopefully, I don't think the world would be terrible if there wasn't any social media. No, I actually think it might be better. But is it? It's mainly Twitter for you, is it? Is that your key one? Yeah, just again, yeah, it's just for special, and also because we don't have proper, um, we don't have independent broadcasters in Wales, and actually, it's a really good way of getting news. Mm. And there's a few like there's a really great um, podcast called Desolation Radio that's really good at like informing you about what the Welsh government does, for example, and what it doesn't. And I think that. Yeah, when you live somewhere like Wales and you actually you don't get any information about anything, and I think the um, like the Wales Online is run by the Mirror Group, so it's, there's no sort of local scrutiny of anything. Right, it's okay. quite vital. Yeah. So you you know you can follow people from universities, or whatever, or you know independent people doing blogs or whatever, and you actually get a bit more information about sure. what people are up to than you would from anywhere. Like mm-hmm. you wouldn't see it on telly. There are definitely good things about it. Yeah. I mean, I think it's, I'm guilty of it myself. I'm very easy to get on your high horse about what's so of course. bad about it. But there are all these great things to it as well. There's probably, and you, I know, like, some... you know, I quite like the escapism of Instagram. I think it can be, and it is pure escapism. It's almost, re- it's, I find that it's like replaced sort of women's magazines, really, more yeah. than anything. Yeah. It's like, oh, there's a nice picture of someone in nice clothes from the high street. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> it's kind of it, really. It's, you know, it's kind of a, like, high street aspirational catalogue. Yeah, it is. So what's, you, you've made a whole album in Welsh. Now you've made a whole one in Cornish. Mm. What would be your next one? I don't know yet, because I didn't realise I was going to make a Cornish album. Mm. Um, But I think it's trying to get to a sort of, I think he's trying to get to a point of freedom and I I don't know what, what that would mean next. Do you think you could make one in English? I know, I do, you know, I have, I've thought about that, like, as in not thought, yeah, I'll definitely do that, but I've, it's it's crossed my mind that I have three languages and, you know, I use the three of them. Mm. And what is the context with, it's quite interesting because you have these sort of three perspectives and what are, are they in relationship to the other? which I'm I'm quite interested in. Um, and particularly, because I think as well, you know, you've got, um, at the end of the day, you are, you, you sort of, you've just got to pursue your own muse. Um, and I've no idea. I've just, I just don't know. Or yeah. no, or no language at all. I've no idea. I was, because I think I was quite interested in not using language at all because mm. of, that's the point I was trying to get to in a way yeah. was that it was and and actually again it's it's to do with the sort of um trying to find what your like what your musical voice is which is actually quite different and i think that's why i've definitely used welsh and cornish because i figured that they would be a tool for me to find it because they're the thing that like if i'm using my voice that would be the most instinctive thing to do yeah and i've absolutely for myself felt oh so much more me than i've been able to be before Midnight Chats is a loud and quiet podcast. Music courtesy of Gold Panda. Search Midnight Chats on iTunes for more episodes and to subscribe. For more information, visit Loud and Quiet.